you very much. Um, I'm here actually because David Pete suggested that I should come, and I'm sorry that he's not here. He was not so well in his health and couldn't come. Um, I enjoyed tremendously Rupert's presentation yesterday, and I'm going to lean on him a lot. So this first slide, what you might uh, intuit, uh, <laughs> shows Vishnu sleeping on the snake Ananta, the snake infinite, uh, on the cosmic ocean and dreaming all possible worlds or possible universes, including like your experience in this moment, my experience in this moment. Um, or uh, it shows Maria calmly asleep in Titignano dreaming of Jane walking the streets of New York, Annabelle <laughs> walking the streets of Tokyo, and so on. Um, and uh, what, what I'm going to focus on is like, uh, how come those dreams appear to have kind of a solid reality in them? How come their overlap uh, appears to be coherent and pointing to a reality which we call matter. So, the, um, as, as I said earlier in, the present, in my presentation, I said it's like, in a normal context, I would have to spend maybe one hour uh, arguing for the primacy of experiencing, but in this context, I can <laughs> relax. <laughs> Uh, Rupert did the job wonderfully yesterday, and you all are very familiar with it. So it's just, I go straight to the question, it's like, how does matter arise out of consciousness? How come those overlapping worlds appear to have a structure or a coherence, which we call matter? Um, that's the opposite of, of the standard scientific assumption of our time, which is matter is primary. And the question is, how does consciousness arise out of it? Uh, So-called the hard problem. And, uh, so we, we don't, fortunately, we don't deal with the hard problem at all. <laughs> it's like consciousness is what's there, is what you're presently experiencing, what I'm presently experiencing. Uh, so the question is like how how this like structured nature of consciousness, which we call matter, how does that arise? Um, I'm going to go through very quickly uh, kind of a brief history of Western thought. And um, in the, in this this picture represents let's say the cosmos of primitive people, what we call primitive people. And it has a darker blue color, which maybe you vaguely distinguish from the background here, uh, which is representing consciousness. And this central part with a dotted line around it represents the I, the self. In, in, in primitive thinking, there is no sharp boundary between self and no self. The whole world is conscious. And the eye has not like a sharp division from, um, from the, the non-I. We've, we've moved away from that. And maybe, if, maybe the first major step away from that is happened about two, three thousand years ago with monotheistic religions, in which like the notion of a transcendent being beyond the world, uh, and of human beings having a special relationship with this transcendent being, uh, and consciousness being inside the human being, or inside God, uh, but not in the world. The world became like the, the, the field for human action, uh, for human subjectivity, but not 
it lost its soul. Um, two, two major steps in the, in the making of modern cosmology. Copernicus uh, moved us to realize that we're not the center of the universe. That the universe appears from a point of view. And our point of view is not necessarily located at the center. Another major step in making of our modern consciousness, how did we come to this uh, world view which is based on matter, is Descartes and his notion of uh, res extensa and res cogitans as two different dimensions. And, and um, Descartes started actually from res cogitans, from mind, as primary realization. But the separation he operated actually uh, historically, the influence it had on the development of Western thought is that it, it freed scientists to deal with the res extensa and forget about res cogitans. Um, so, focusing on the intrinsic laws of what appeared as out there, that, that's, that's a picture of our world today. It's like, we're here. We're no longer at the center. And there's no consciousness out here. There's a vast expen expanse of inert matter. Consciousness is present in, in this little dot, in us, if at all. Because we could also, one, one current interpretation is that consciousness is not there at all. It's somehow an epiphenomenon, an apparent phenomenon, uh, which has no uh, essential reality. Um, this world view has strong consequences. That's a picture of the world at night that's seen from space. And all those lights <laughs> are like human presences. And this, this is an astronaut walking on the moon. And this is, this is the Large Hadron Collide, Collider at CERN. Uh, but also this. This is Nigeria, oil fields. And this. Uh, so there's some very creative consequences of that worldview, but very destructive also. The, the paradox is that within science itself, that worldview which takes matter as being primary and the essential reality of things, uh, has appeared to be inconsistent and has come into a crisis with quantum physics. Uh, some physicists don't take that crisis too seriously, uh, but there's an increasing number that is taking it very seriously. So what I'm trying next is to give you like a, a rush course in quantum physics. This, this is a very famous experiment which is reproduced in all the first year texts of quantum physics. It points out some essential features uh, of, of the theory. The experience consists that there's a beam of particles coming in from the left there and going through a screen with two slits, A and B and falling on a photographic plate or some kind of detector on the other side here. Um, each, each particle leaves one, falls on the screen and leaves one specific dot. And the question I'm asking myself is that 
what will be the distribution of these dots? What will be the blackening of the, of the photographic plate? And I can do various experiments here. I can close one slit and leave one open. And if I leave, let's say, solo, only slit a, a open, I will get a distribution somewhat like this, with a, with a maximum in front of the slit and then fading out on the two sides. If I leave just slit B open, I will get a curve like this. Uh, now, if, if I can assume that each particle either goes through A or through B, then the consequence of that would be that I should see the superposition of these two curves, the sum of these two curves. All that go through A make this one, all that go through B make this one. All together they make... But that's not what I see. What I see is that when, the, when both slits are open, the pattern is this wavy thing here. This wavy pattern is typical of when two waves interfere. So, I'm dealing with a paradoxical situation here in which what I call particle leaves actually a specific dot on the screen, which is what I expect from a particle, but the statistics of these dots is a wave. So one first approximation to describing this is like there's a dual particle wave nature. Maybe the, the strongest impact is the realization that I cannot think of each particle as going through either A or B. Because that would imply this consequence. Uh, so I'm forced to realize that in some sense it goes through both. Um, one more thing. If I decide to capture it, to catch it in this tricky act of going through both slits, and I put a detector next to one of the slits, let's say a Geiger counter, which is like a device that when a particle passes through it, it clicks, it gives a signal. Uh, I put a Geiger counter here and say, okay, now I will see if it really passes through A or B. As soon as I turn on my Geiger counter, this pattern disappears and I have actually the superposition of these two. As I turn it off, I go back to this. So, that Geiger counter has quite um, an impact on what's going on here. How do, how do physicists understand that? Um, the model of a particle or a wave by itself does not account for the whole phenomenon. Uh, the model which was developed is like what we call a particle is actually a cloud of probability. It's a cloud of potential, uh, potential outcomes of experiments. Um, there's nothing substantial there. There's like only possible outcomes of observations made on it. Um, this was, uh, was a tough one to chew for most people, including the creators of the theory themselves. And in this picture, these two people are Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein, who kept discussing these issues, how to understand these things uh, for over eight years. And during, during which time Einstein kept um, proposing to Bohr imaginary experiments and, and showing that if you interpret them the quantum physics way, you would come to absurd results. And Bohr was quite clever in dismounting Einstein's argument. Uh, but 
the masterpiece of, of these imaginary experiments is one that Einstein devised in 1935. And that put Bohr in quite some trouble. He wasn't so um, clear in answering. Uh, and it's, uh, it's called as the EPR, or einstein podolsky rosen experiment. And it's an experiment which brings out an aspect of quantum physics which we now call entanglement, which is like, nowadays, it's like a basic concept widely accepted as like an intrinsic feature of quantum physics. But in 1935, it seemed like so outlandish that Einstein proposed it as this shows that quantum physics could not possibly be right. Uh, what, what's entanglement? In this, in this version of the experiment, the experiment is done with two particles with spin. It could be realized in many different ways. But let's say um, we have a system, for example, an atom that splits, uh, a, a system with zero spin, which splits in two parts. Uh, since the total spin is conserved, uh, then those two parts will have correlated spins, uh, one the opposite of the other. Uh, now, spin, we don't need to go into what spin, spin is. The only thing we need to know is something that can be measured in any of 360 degrees orientations in space. And when it gets measured in one specific orientation, will give either a result plus one or minus one. Let's say there's two outcomes. Huh? Entanglement means the following. What quantum physics predicts is that at however far away, if we have like two observers here, Alice and Bob, each one with their measuring device, they can choose to orient it in any possible orientation, uh, and they measure each one, one particle, these two particles with opposite spin moving, uh, moving apart. Um, entanglement says the following. It's, it's sometimes misunderstood as meaning that there is a correlation between what Alice observes and what Bob observes. Almost, not quite. What, what entanglement says is the following. How Alice decides to orient her apparatus has an influence on the statistics of results that Bob sees. However far away they are, however instant is, however close in time are the orientation of these two apparatus, even if, like, in principle, they should be, like, instantaneous at whatever distance, how she decides to orient her apparatus influences his result. How he decides to orient his apparatus influences her results. So, um, in some ways, it's as if these, these two systems, these are what we call two things here, they're not two things. In some ways, it's like they're one. They keep being one after being separate. Um, as I said, at, at, in 1935, this seems like something so absurd that Einstein proposed it as quantum physics cannot be right. Uh, at the time, the technology was not sufficient to perform the experiment in a cogent way which would mean like these observers being widely separated and time, timing being very so narrowly, um, so closed that, that, uh, not even, not e that no signal could travel from one to the other. Uh, but the problem became very interesting in, uh, in the 60s when John Bell went back to it and analyzed it in logical terms, uh, forgetting about quantum physics or any physics, 
and just reasoning in putting in like abstract logical assumption and looking at the consequences for the results of this experiment. And the, the assumption that Bell put in are realism, two assumptions, he called them realism and locality. Realism means that spin is actually a property belonging to the particle. It's, it's not in my eyes, it's in the thing out there. Uh, locality means that uh, any consequence at a distance must correspond to some kind of signal that travels from one to another. <coughs> so there is like no instantaneous distance uh, action at a distance without signals, without some kind of action. Now, these two ideas taken together, realism and locality, uh, are a pretty good description of what we mean by an object. A thing. A thing is something local and realistic. Has intrinsic properties, interacts through actions, and um, that's that's quite interesting because Bo uh, Bell's theory, uh, theorem uh, shows us that the consequences uh, predicted by quantum physics and the consequences predicted by realism and localities don't overlap. They're different. So that the experiment, in principle, offers us a way to distinguish between quantum physics on one side and any realistic local theory on the other. So the technology was there to perform the experiments in 1980. And the experiment uh, fully agreed with the predictions of quantum physics and not with realism and locality. So, no matter what theory might in the future replace quantum physics, it won't be a realistic local theory. Said it more roughly, the world is not made of things. There is no theory that describes the world in realistic local terms. One, one big open problem in quantum physics is the fact that in spite, in spite the fact that the theory is extremely accurate in, in a vast field of phenomena, the description of the basic act of observation has remained problematic in almost a hundred years since the beginning of the, of, of the theory. And it has remained problematic for, I believe, deep philosophical reasons. Uh, the problematic nature of it um, is to describe what, what's commonly called like the collapse of the wave function, which means the following. Um, as I said, like the, the way we describe this is like a cloud of probabilities, like a, a superposition of potential outcomes. I could, this cloud could be like more dense or more, or more um, sparse. Uh, depending, if, if it's more dense, there's a higher probability of, of finding the electron there, uh, or less to find it in another place. But all those, it's not that the electron is either here or there. The electron is in some sense, like, everywhere in the cloud at the same time. Uh, and yet, when it hits the screen, it hits in one point. When I put a Geiger counter here, it either clicks or does not click. So, how do I understand that? How do I go from that superposition of, of potential outcomes to one definite, specific 
outcome. The trouble with that is that that transition is incompatible with like basic, basic assumptions of the theory. So quantum theory can never describe the transition from a superposition of states to one definite outcome within, within that superposition. Peculiar situation. It's like we have a very good theory. <laughs> this very good theory is unable to describe its own basic phenomenon <laughs> of like how do we observe reality. Um, in, in the last almost 100 years, people have proposed various ways of understanding and trying to fit in the collapse, and they are still trying. Uh, but let the, let's say the modern understanding of it, or let's say the majority view on it, uh, is the collapse is not really there. So that leaves us with the, with the, with the problem of understanding how does it appear to be there? Why do things behave as if it's there? And I, I, want, I want to suggest a jump, which I'm not going to take, but I'm going to just skirt around and <laughs> play with, between um, the superposition of all potential reality and the experience of a specific world, between um, Mary asleep in Titignano and Jane walking through the streets of New York. Um, why does the wave function appear to collapse, even though it's not? A way to reformulate the question is, why there are two equivalent descriptions. On one level, there's the description of the uncollapsed wave function in which all possibilities are simultaneously present. And on the other, there's the description in which like, one specific outcome happens. I was working on this problem long time ago, in the late, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and it developed into the, the understanding of this phenomenon, which is like nowadays, by most physicists, considered, uh, let's say, the fairly standard understanding of it, uh, which is called decoherence. I'm not going to go into the details of it, though, because um, I was never fully happen, happy with that understanding. So I went back to rethinking it in a more, um, like viewing it as a consequence of some basic philosophical assumptions. Um, and there are some experiments in quantum physics which hint us, give us a hint in how to understand this phenomenon. One, uh, one of these e experiments is called the quantum eraser. Um, it could be described this way. I'm not literally describing how it's done, but uh, like catching some essential features of it. Suppose that instead of having a Geiger counter here, uh, when the particle passes through here, it causes a secondary particle to be generated and, shut and, and, and to shoot off where it will be revealed. Why am I doing this? Because then I could play with this. I could, uh, let's say, if the secondary particle is shut off from here, uh, it's the information about the electron passing through the slit is there. It's, 
it's captured in this secondary particle that I have generated. But at this level, quantum physics can also erase information. So, what happens is that as long as this particle contains the information about the electron going through here, uh, the superposition of these two curves is there. And when I erase this information, I go back to this. So, um, the fact... I'm, I'm going quite quickly through this, but the fact that the word appears classical to us, it appears either or, either through A or through, through B, this type of result, is connected with information being somehow recorded. As soon as that information is erased, I'm back in the superposition of all possibilities. Why, why is this significant in a philosophical way? Because all our experience of the world happens, let's say, is structured in such a way that we appear to be located within the world and within a body. We are experiencing the world from within a body. Which means like all our experiences are correlated with a happening, a change, a process, a something in a body. So all our experiences are connected to a recording of information. And that's the reason why the word appears classical to us. It appears either or. It appears like solid reality. Okay, this, it, this is tricky and subtle, so I'm sure we'll have <laughs> to, to discuss and investigate it further and so on. Um, I've been struck by how densely and beautifully the first chapter of the Tao Te Ching speaks about all this. That's, of course, one way of reading it. But uh, the, f the first uh, verse of the Tao Te Ching says, Tao ke Tao fei chang Tao. The Tao that can be spoken is not a constant Tao, or is not the eternal Tao, or is not the ultimate Tao, um, which can be taken on one level as a reminder of the, the postmodern realization that um, that all our discourse about reality is a model, is a map, is uh, the map, and the map is not the territory. So we are only comparing maps. And Magritte's formulation is, this is not a pipe. It's a picture of a pipe. We forget. <laughs> we take pictures for pipes. <laughs> but the, the reading of this, of the Taoists, is quite different from the reading of postmodern thinkers. If, if language does not capture reality, uh, if reality is beyond all maps, uh, then the postmodern thinker says, well, let's not talk about reality anymore, and we we'll just focus on discourse, and how discourse creates uh, intersubjective worlds. And uh, The Taoist went the other way. If discourse does not catch reality, forget about discourse, <laughs> and experience reality. So one, one sense in which like, the first verse of the Tao Te Ching can be read is just this. But there's, there's deeper levels to it. 
there's the deeper levels to it, which has to do with the second verse uh, of, of the Tao Te Ching is Ming Ke Ming Fei Chang Ming. Uh, all naming that can be named is not constant naming. Uh, what, what, does, what does Lao Tzu mean by naming? I think it, we can take it at various levels. At one level is like mental representations of reality, and that's quite obvious how to read it at that level. But I would like to propose that it has a deeper level. And the deeper level is like um, the apparent split that in, in experience happens between subject and object. So it's like the fact that experience is structured in some ways that we perceive ourselves as objects, as, as subjects confronting a world out there. So it's like, let's take for a moment that naming points to this, to this split. The next verse says, without naming is the origin of heaven and earth. Naming is the mother of the 10,000 things. So, out of that primary split, subject, object, arise all the apparent multiplicity, variety of reality, the world of 10,000 things. And he connects that to, to desire and no desire, which like as soon, as soon as I'm in that split and I'm identified with this subject confronting the world out there, then I'm moved by desire. Desire is the basic motion of the separate self. And it will be like desire for concrete objects uh, and ultimately, as Rupert pointed out, desire for its own ultimate nature. Uh, but the being, being in naming, being in that identified with that split is in itself intrinsically frustration or suffering. That's what Buddha points out with his first noble truth. Existence is suffering. And existence, as Rupert said yesterday, is ex sister, standing out. As soon as I stand out as separate, I'm bound to be frustrated. And a metaphor that I like very much is that of the ocean and the wave. Just, just from a strictly scientific point of view, uh, there are no separate objects in the universe. There are only fields permeating the whole space-time and superposing, interacting. I'm a superposition of those fields in this moment here. Um, so it's like the wave has no ultimate reality in itself. It's not even like a specific mass of water. It's just a pattern moving through the ocean. If I'm, as a wave, I'm identified with my waveness, I am bound to suffer. Because the wave dissolves in, in the ocean, dissolves in other ways. Uh, so, um, Lao Tzu says, therefore, without desire, you experience the mystery or you experience the wonder. With desire, you experience the boundaries, the 10,000 things, our embodied existence, our joys and struggle. And, um, but then the really interesting point is the last verse. Last verse of the first chapter of the Tao Te Ching. Because Lao Tzu is not recommending stepping out of the world. Where else could you go? 
Uh, he says, these two, the two being like naming and no name, desire and desirelessness, he says, these two arise together, but we call them different names. Holding them together is the secret of secrets. It's the, ga the gate of all wonders. Wave and ocean. Okay, that's essentially what I'm saying. Thank you.